good job at the mine out there. My family have been in the mining business since clear back in the late 1800s. And mines don't last forever. Well, when we first went there in 1962, it was a mining town, that's all it was, and it had been a mining town for nearly 100 years. Most places that you ever traveled in the United States would, would have any idea, never had heard of Telluride and had no idea where it was. You got to have dreams uh, or thoughts and uh, well, how wacky they are, I don't know, but mine were pretty wacky. Well, that's me skiing, believe it or not. Oh. <laughs> We'd ski anything we could find where there was snow. You see those old pictures of this guy skiing up on top of Lizard Head in 1924. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just skied around town, and of course the miners all skied. I guess you'd call it skiing. It was mainly to get from one place to the other, snowshoeing or going on the long boards. My dad, believe it or not, in 1899, he was 15 years old, and him and his dad made a pair of skis. They're in the museum down here uh, over when he lived in Bonanza, Colorado, because that's where he done his skiing. My skiing started, like I say, on Catholic Hill when we moved here from Rico uh, when I was three years old. And then we just, you know, skied Oak Street and uh, got pulled behind cars. Oh, about 1937, a school teacher by the name of Bruce Palmer showed up on the scene. He uh, started to encourage the kids to go ski, and he lived over on Catholic Hill, and that was our uh, our ski uh, run over there uh, where the Catholic Church is. Bruce was an Austrian, and wherever he came from, he had learned to ski. And Bruce talked the superintendent of schools to any kid that was interested in skiing, if they could find some skis, that he wanted to have a, a ski clinic or a ski school. And we never had a name for it, but that was the first ski school that was ever in Telluride that I'm aware of. The guy that I'd done the most skiing in the early years was my brother Bob, and Jack, Jack Mahoney, my other brother. My younger one, he wasn't a very good skier, so we didn't ski with him. Uh, we skied an awful lot over on what to call the, the Grizzly Gulch of the power line over there. You know, there was depression time and there, nobody had any equipment. I remember my dad bought me a pair of skis for $15 from Spiggles and they were made out of ash. And of course, skis in those days did not have binders, just a leather strap and that was it. And you could only go straight down the hill or, or have a pole and drag yourself to cause you to turn. Then uh, Bruce Palmer is the one that had made the first pair of binders that I had. It's just a couple of pieces of angle iron with a leather strap that buckled to the, the back of your foot. And at least you could stay in your, on your skis. Then they come up with the, the bear trap binders that, where you would lock your feet in. It was a good way to break your leg. I wear a size seven and a half shoe. The boots I used were 12s. They were hand-me-downs from, from, from somebody. You know, Bruce Palmer would get a lot of this old equipment and, uh, and as kids would use it, you know. Any way to, uh, so you could go ski it. As far as uh, the ski poles, where the, a lot of kids would make their own out of willows and just put a, uh, uh, the bottom part of a uh, uh, one pound uh, coffee can, you know, the lid, and stick that on there and tie it up with some leather strings and whatnot. It worked until it would fall apart. And then Bruce uh, tried to promote a lift down where the present day Coonskin lift is. Uh, and he went to the Forest Service and tried to get a permit. And he even bought some cables and stuff like that to build a lift, which he never, never did happen. And I guess that was probably in 37, 38, and 39. In the 40s, during the war, uh, if you weren't wearing in the service, which I wasn't in the early part of it, we could, the Alta Mine was running and they kept the road open and we would go up there and put on our skis and ski down through the trees and come out of Turkey Creek. 
or we would uh, go down Boomerang Road and uh, end up down in the valley floor down there. You could ski the road all the way. And, or you could uh, <coughs> climb up on the power line and ski down through Prospect Basin and then climb back up and ski from nine down the power line into town. We've done that once or twice a year, you know. We created many lifts here in Telluride. The, uh, over at the ballpark, the first one was in 1944. Uh, happened to be that my brother Bob and Ed Goldsworthy built it and it was a, a rope tow and it worked pretty well. A fellow by the name of Tony Thornton and Gus Sands over at the Beaver Pond that's in, in downtown Telluride built a little rope tow over there with a Brad Stratton engine. We had a portable ski deal on a 1937 Nash car. Parents had put together a, a rope tow um, that ran on the wheel of a car. So if we, if there was gas to put in the car, then we could have the rope tow running. The car would be on top and we'd uh, take the rope down and ski uh, that slope down there, uh, down to the tree line in the West Meadows over there. And then at the end of the day, we could ski all the way down Alien through the trees and have somebody pick us up. Most of the generation in Telluride, the, the adults, the, the miners, they, they just weren't into that kind of thing. They, they'd go fishing or that type of thing, but they weren't into recreational sports. There just weren't that many of them. When I was really young, um, skiing was not a big part of most people's lives here. Um, my dad, I think, was one of the exceptions, and there were other people who were interested in skiing. So it wasn't like you did that with a lot of people, but um, with just a few friends. But not very few people, adults, did any hiking. They didn't. They didn't go up high. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, older people in Telluride, ladies and men both, that had never been up on top of the mountains. They, I was just sort of stunned when I realized this because I thought, gosh, think about that. Their whole perception of where they are is is from the bottom of this valley looking up. They've never been up on top and looked around and down. I said they, they just don't know what they're missing. But they they just weren't into that kind of thing. Of course, when I originally came to Telluride, there was a little rope tow over in the, in the town baseball park, and the uh, tow mechanism was uh, electric motor driven. Actually, went up to where the Bear Creek Road goes up. The skiing on Firecracker Hill over at the park was really hard. I mean, there was no nobody packed anything. The packing that happened was generally, you know, the kids and the adults walking up, up the ski mountain sideways on their skis. And it was really a lot of just like skiing down, a, you know, a little uh, three foot trail and then coming out into an open area and then try to make your way down to the bottom without falling. It was kind of hard sometimes to get down. So you tried to get off where other people had already gotten off so you could ski over and then you did the one little run. And that was always kind of packed because enough people were there. So the first part of the season was pretty rough going because you had uh, weeds and rocks and whatnot and you, know, you never could predict what you were going to hit. You had to learn you know, how to turn through fresh snow and unpack snow and chop snow in different conditions. We used to say that the local school kids could learn to ski there and as they got a little older and uh, bigger they, they could go from there and they could go to, for a weekend at Crested Butte or Aspen and they could ski anything on the mountain because uh, our hill, the bottom of the plunge there where our rope toe was, uh, was as steep as anything that most of those areas had. Train, 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 you know, uh, skiing through the old willows that we put up. That was what we used for, for uh, instead of the bamboo or whatever they use now, they're all, I guess they're fiberglass now, it's just a, a bamboo, uh, just a willow stuck in the ground with a flag tied on. And then our downhill race on Grizzly Gulch, we used the, uh, the power poles. You went around those, you better not hit one. But <laughs> anyway, it worked, no one ever got hurt that I can remember anyway. We even had a jumping contest. We would take old wooden doors and set those up where they could see how far the kids could jump. And that was only open on weekends. It was a, it was a local ski high ski club in Telluride. All volunteers. I believe that the Idorado donated, um, you know, the some of the materials and then allowed some of their workers to do some of the the welding and things that needed to be done and the, and the uh, splicing of the ropes. But it was mainly volunteer labor and, uh, you know, 
with with the parents more than anything. You know, it made you learn how to work and appreciate what the uh, little skier was all about when you had to go over there and spend two or three weekends of summer helping move brush and burn brush and do whatever had to happen. The small amount of money that was uh, asked for by the parents through the little membership that you had to pay for bought things like the rope and, you know, different things that were needed to make the little little rope toe work. Once in a while, um, you know, people would say, oh my gosh, these bumps are too big and you'd go up and um, some people would have shovels and they'd break down the bumps or you'd, um, you know, pack them out with your boots. We had those here of 10 lifts from 19, uh, from the early, thir late 30s up until 1969. And uh, the first lifts, well, you just held on with your hands. Well, when we built this here, 1,200-foot uh, lift down there at Grizzly Gulch down there, uh, most of the little kids couldn't hang on. You would grab onto the rope, hold on as tight as you could, and that was fine for about the first eight or ten trips. But then your hands got so tired, you couldn't even get a hold, and there'd just be these little pieces of leather flying everywhere. <laughs> You were strong and you certainly went through several pairs of mittens. And I can still kind of smell that smell because you were always so grimy wet by the end of the day and you ruined a lot of your jackets because at least the way I held on, it wore everything underneath. So I, probably everybody walked around the right? had big holes in, on one side of their jacket. There's probably not a lot of people that have ever ridden a rope tow, but yeah, it was very hard to hold on to. and. They actually came out with a device. A rope gripper, we called it a nutcracker because it looked like a nutcracker. Uh, and it was the belt went around your waist and had a, a, a little string that was hooked onto that and you would clamp that on, uh, on the rope and put your hand behind you and it would pull you up and then you would uh, let go and then the nutcracker would pop open, supposedly. If not, then the rope would break so it wouldn't pull you into the shiv wheel. The first time that the Kids Hill was built at the Coonskin, it went straight up the hill. And it was so hard to hold on to because it was so steep that they realigned it and put it on an angle. You'd be on the lift, you'd be going up, and then where it got steep, you know, if there, you were supposed to allow a certain amount of space between each sphere on the lift. Well, even with that, if one person was stuck and started going backwards, then it was just like this dominoes kind of thing where everybody was just going back down the hillside. And then pretty soon everybody would fall over. One memory I have is of Eileen, who had a long ponytail, getting her hair caught in the, in the uh, rope toe. And I think it was Johnny Stevens who had a pocket knife and he uh, hiked up the mountain because she was hanging kind of by her hair, he cut, had to cut her hair. Where the kids hill was at the bottom of Coonskin, there was a little snack shack that all the parents would take turns running for the weekend, which was a big part of it. And of course, senior and you know a lot of the, a lot of the men, but mainly senior, uh, would organize uh, you know people to go up and work on the, on the rope tow and do whatever they had to do to make it run. That's why everybody wanted to see a ski lift be built in town because it'd be a, so much easier to get up to the top and then you could ski down. Most guys just wore Levi's and, uh, you know, a coat and, uh, and just a big old pair of mittens and that was it, you know. A lot of kids in those days wore long underwear and that kept you warm and they didn't have the, the nice clothes they have today. Then we um, often skied in jeans. I did ski in blue jeans or corduroys and a sweater. I did have some ski pants, but uh, I really don't, I think everybody was pretty much in blue jeans. Then we had snow pants that were, you know, stuffed, and so they were really bulky and slick. And, you know, if you fell down, then you slid, you know, half the way down the mountain. Of course, as they got older into high school, then, of course, teenagers, they had to have, you know, what their perception of the latest, coolest clothing was. Doyle Duncan, had the, he was a barber had the barber shop, and then he upstairs he had a little ski shop in definition only. I guess he had a few, you know, he'd, he'd carry some gloves and uh, knit caps and goggles and a few things like that. I got a pink ski suit, but it was pink stretch pants and a pink jacket and a pink hat. 
And I think about that, and I was so proud of that outfit. My dad bought me a pair of lace leather boots, and I was so excited to go ski on them. But he bought them a little bit big, you know, thinking that I'd grow into them over the years. Well, the first run that I took down the ski mountain, I fell, and both of my feet came out of my boots. <laughs> I mean, you're laying there in the snow in your sock and feet. <laughs> I remember the first pair of metal skis that I got was a pair of head standard skis in the early 70s, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. We skied on Dallas. John Herndon and his family, I believe, started the Dallas program. There were some others that were involved in it too, but it was much like the, the Telluride ski area where families would just go and work on it, maintain it, and, you know, ask for donations to keep it going. But it was really better than what we had because they had a T-bar. And it was a bigger hill. But the snow was much more sporadic over there than it was in Telluride. It didn't seem like they ever really had the coverage that we had to ski and you know not hit a bunch of rocks and whatnot. But we'd have little races over there all the time. But most people in Telluride didn't, didn't feel like it was worth driving over there to ski there because their mountain really wasn't as good as our hill there at the bottom of the plunge. My dad took us to a lot of ski areas outside of town. We got to go to Crested Butte, and I got to go to Aspen, and I did Ski Dallas, and I did Powderhorn. And it was like my mom would fix us fried chicken and potato salad, and dad would take a carload of kids. And I can't remember if it was on a Saturday and Sunday, but you left in the dark, and you got back really late at night. But I thought it was a great opportunity he gave us. I remember skiing at Stoner more than Ski Dallas. The hill was really even bigger. They had a little lodge there and we'd go over and, and we'd ski a day and spend the night and ski the next day and that was great fun. I thought it was a great opportunity he gave us to go see other ski areas and there you probably did get to ride lifts, you know, because we'd never been on lifts before. It was pretty unusual um, for girls to ski in Telluride. A lot of girls were not very outdoors at all. Um, you know, they were more into being inside and, and doing girl things. Maybe the girls didn't go to the backcountry as much, but I think boys were totally supportive of, of the girls too. You know, probably the girls annoyed them sometimes because girls do stupid things according to boys. The boys had already learned how to do turns because Jerry Pessman was teaching them how to do turns and they told us that we couldn't ski anymore until, unless we learned how to make turns because we were making too big of a groove in, the, in where they wanted to ski and so that was kind of our incentive to learn to make turns. Everybody did everything together, you know, you, you went sledding together. I, there wasn't a distinction whether you were a girl or a boy. Well, the, the men and the boys, I think, were happy to have some girls who were interested in skiing. There was this sort of, yeah, it's fine, and you're a girl, but you're an okay girl because you're willing to try to take these chances, you know, to do something. Both Dick Sword Fager and, and Senior Mahoney were great about being patient with us, you know, waiting for us if they, if they needed to, and just encouraging us to, you know, be out there a little bit more. But I did enjoy it more when I was in middle school and high school, and basically because that's what all the other kids did. And, you know, as a teenage girl, that's where the guys were, that's where you went. When I got acquainted with Dick Schwarzfinger when he came here in the early 60s, that's when we started to ski in the backcountry. I went in the mine every day. I was the engineer. Mahoney was a shift boss. I soon learned you know, Mahoney was a skier and there were a few others, but not actually too many of the adults skied. And mostly Mahoney and, and myself and most of the others were just the high school kids like Junior and Alan Rana. And I think it was in 1964 that the first improved snow machines came out. Johnson built a snowmobile and they called it the Ski Horse and it was a wide track, slower snowmobile, but it, it would climb a, a pretty good steep hill in, in soft snow. Well, Mahoney bought this Ski Horse and when he found it, he could take it up through the old logging road, clear to the top, and then uh, we could ski down the power line. He could take his machine and put his skis along the side and take one passenger in his skis then later, I bought a, another Johnson. We'd leave the snowmobiles on top, of course, and ski to town. And then another guy worked in the mine 
had a ski horse. We'd borrow his and Billy and I'd go back up and then take a rope to, and tie one of the snowmobiles on behind him. He, he'd tow it down and I'd drive the other one down, but that was quite a project. Senior would, uh, would take us up on snowmobiles and it was a real treat when we got to go with him to do that. Finally, they started saying, well, you know, we're just driving the ski doos We want to be able to ski, so if you're going to come with us anymore, you have to drive the ski doo at least one-third of the time. It would be, you know, kind of calm, kind of calm, and then it, would get, it got steeper and steeper, and then there was this one particular switchback where you almost always couldn't gun it enough to get you on the ski doo pulling two skiers on the back up over the top of that. And um, the, so that's my biggest recollection. It's not so much about the skiing, it's about being scared to death to drive that ski to up there. The whole idea was to find some place where you could, you could somehow get pretty high with a vehicle and then climb up some and then get a good long run out the, the north side. And that was hard to find. Finally getting up there and the sun being in the sky and the, the light on the snow, it was, it was phenomenal and intimidating. And We could get up as high as we could get until we ran into the snow pack and then we'd park the Jeep and we'd carry our ski boots and, and wear boots and a little backpack with lunch and we'd, we'd hike up to the top of the ridge and then we'd ski down the north side like East Bear Creek or uh, La Hunta Basin into town. The summer skiing that we did was Certainly way different than on the kids' hill because, yeah, we were two or three thousand feet vertical higher than, than the little ski area. This was all in the 60s when that happened. You'd walk up there and you wouldn't see anybody. Because the snow was so deep and, you know, there weren't any tracks or anything, you, you could just point down the hill and just ski. Uh, you know, from Bradavale Basin to uh, La Hunta Basin to East Bear Creek to uh, the Blue Lakes over on Snapples to Imogene, past Governor Basin, you name it, we, if there was snow there, we would ski it. Yeah, we skied on the rocks. Uh, that was kind of a, just, just for the fun of it, you know, the, of course we were using old rock skis, we call them, and just ski down and go see how far you could get across the grass and the rocks before you ground to a halt. Pretty hard to, to do a good edge turn on, on grass or rocks. This is Senior coming off the top of East Bear Creek. He didn't bother to take off his skis when he got to a rock outcrop. He just walked along across it anyway. <laughs> well, I wanted to keep the bottoms dull so I didn't go very fast. Yeah. You know, when I'd go out on climbing the damn mountains up there, I'd, I think maybe that's why I'm still alive is because I did a lot of climbing, smoking as I was going up and breathing that damn junk out of my lungs. I don't know. Coming down, you're taking a, you know, a drag or two. <laughs> You know, when you go out like that, oh, you, you try to have as much fun as you possibly can. We didn't do any drinking. No, no, that was a no-no. I look back and I don't know why in the world we done it, but it was something that, that well, look at they're doing it today. The guys are in the back country just all the time, you know. My dad would always take different kids and those were the few times I got to go. This is Mona and her friend up at the uh, Imogene Pass up there. They. I took them up there skiing. That girl had never skied before. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mahoney's school of sink or swim. <laughs> Some of the, uh, the summer skiing that, that I was involved in with Senior and Dick Swordfigure were, they were pretty epic. Well, we spent more time hiking up than we did actually uh, for the ski run down. El Morana took his scout, he had a four-wheel drive scout, he took Senior and I and Alan ran his boy over Ofer Pass, down towards Silverton, and then up South Mineral Creek, and then up into Clear Lake Basin. We could get up there quite a ways, and he let us off. And we hiked up through Clear Lake Basin and over up the, into Ice Lake Basin, and then heading up to the head of Swamp Canyon, skied down that. And he had come back over Ofer Pass, and then he picked us up there, and then he hauled us up as far as he could get up the Blix's Road, and then we hiked up the top of. East Bear Creek and then ski down into town. We probably got maybe pretty close to, well, maybe a 5,000 vertical. You put both of them together. The snow had settled so well that it was just like a good ski area packed run. I mean, except once in a while you'd, you'd run into a, a soft spot where some dust had blown in or something and, you know, accumulated enough heat to soften that and, and you couldn't tell it in advance. So you'd be skiing down and all of a sudden 
you, your feet would just sink in to about knee deep and you'd do a big face plant, you know. And of course, when we were trying to get up high in the Telluride side to do some skiing, we, of course, obviously knew you stay away from any avalanche paths and just didn't get in the, that area. And we didn't have the business of the avalanche control in those days, you know, no skaties or shovels and I didn't, I, I got buried a couple of times in avalanches and they, they, they scared the heck out of me. In the springtime when things started to warm up and soften up, uh, that was one of the worst times to get out so nobody did. Well there were three or four of us high school kids over there and we skied down and one of our friends wasn't with us and we went, well we didn't, we didn't know what happened to him. We told Cecil Goldsworthy, who was his uncle, that Desty didn't make it down. And he goes, hmm, you know, what happened? And we could see that there was a, a small avalanche in the trees where we'd skied down. And he said, why don't you guys go back up and look for him and see if you can find him. And we did, and we couldn't find him. And in the meantime, he was down there with, with a probe pole because he, he, with his mining training, he knew what to do. And he found him with a probe pole and dug him up and he wasn't breathing and uh, gave him CPR and brought him around. He was really lucky that he made it. I remember when we skied down the Mammoth Slide, Senior would go, you know, this is, this is an avalanche, we have to be careful, but we didn't have any idea what the protocol was to ski, a, ski in an avalanche. I mean, I don't think anybody at the time did, because that was in the late 60s and early 70s when we were doing that. So we'd just kind of jump in it and hope for the best and ski down. We took a lot of chances, especially the one that I don't know why we didn't get killed was uh, the mammoth slide that's up the top of nine. Uh, but it, we were lucky that we didn't, somebody didn't get killed on that. Once we started on the ski patrol and learned about avalanche safety and the transceivers and all that, I'd look back on what we used to do and go, you know, we were probably pretty lucky. Well, I don't know why we didn't break our legs more often. <laughs> you know, I often wonder if we had injured ourselves. We didn't have any rescue oh. in Taylorette at that oh, time. Oh, no, yeah. I guess you'd have just died. <laughs> I had a good job at the mine out there, but you know, my family had been in the mining business from clear back in the late 1800s, and mines don't last forever. All the kids that you know, were going out to college, they were going to go come back and go mining. I had two children here in Telluride, and they're, they're still here today, and why are they here? Because our economy changed. It went from mining to recreation, and thank God for that. I've had a passion for something for skiing here in Telluride, and I, I've promoted it every chance I could get, you know. Back in 1940, before World War II, the Rotary Club in Telluride made a proposal to the Forest Service to build a ski complex over at Trout Lake on what you call on the north side of Sheep Mountain. And they come up and, and looked at it and said that they would, in the spring, they would start uh, uh, getting some land that was privately owned and uh, put a complex over there. Well, of course, the war fouled that up. And then all through the war, there was no movement on it. And then, of course, a lot of the guys like Gus Sands and Tony Thornton, after the war, they found there was other things out in the world and they didn't come back to Telluride. So we lost a lot of supporters. The next go around, as far as developing the ski area, was the one in 1959 and 60, the Telluride Ski Inc, as they called it. All the land that, uh, that Joe Zoline finally put together was, uh, was under option at those days. The Adams land, the Verano, uh, and right on down the line. And uh, there was actually stock certificates sold for that. My parents bought stock in that. You know, it was a little company. They realized, um, you know, Telluride was on a downhill slide during that time in the 60s. They had tried that and failed. The, the Elks had raised a bunch of money and given it as a Dallas promotion outfit who, you know, spent it on Bahamas uh, vacations or something, but it never amounted to anything. I was an outsider, so to speak, but I was still in the mining business, so they, they accepted me quickly into the, you know, into the fold. But I had come, I had skied at, at uh, Aspen and, and uh, places like that, and of course, and I, first very quickly 
uh, learned that Mahoney was, you know, gung ho for skiing and had been trying to develop a ski area. And I, I agreed. I thought this has got great potential. Of course, the, the remote location was a real drawback. And then the next go around, as I recall, was in 1964. There was Dick Schwarzfinger and I, and I forget the other guys. There was we were on the town council. And Urine Gertz had showed up in Telluride, and also Jerry Pesman from the Telluride Ski. We made a proposal to build a lift up the front hillside in the town to get a small business loan. Well, what happened there, it went before the town council, and three of us voted for it, and three voted against it, and the mayor voted against it. So that it was a $70,000 deal to build a lift from the depot to Camel's Garden. The town would have been a proud owner of a ski area if they'd have done it. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, were, were against any, any, any movement like that. And so that's consequently, that's why the, the, uh, uh, the councilman turned it down. There were local businessmen uh, that, did, you know, that could, could imagine if a ski area did uh, come to town and succeed that they would benefit from that. Uh, of course, there weren't that many businessmen in town. You know. I used to go to other skiers and tell them that Taylorite has that good potential, but they didn't even know the word Taylorite, where it was at, you know. The prettiest spot up there, I recall, was where the Mountain Village is today. It was, there were about three or four beaver ponds there where all the big buildings are in the core of the village. And you just, you drive up there and you'd look at that and you go, this is really, really a pretty spot. And they, that's where they would take these people and show them you know, that this would probably be, be where something may happen for ski area. The key to the, getting to develop a ski area in Taylorite was money. And we were, were isolated, we're still kind of isolated today. Joe Zoline showed up in 68 or 69, I think, were, were his first visits. He had heard about the Telluride area and the potential from people he had met in Aspen where he had a, a vacation home at that time. He talked, you know, real impressive, but we, everybody said, well, let's wait and see what happens. So he finally, you know, got some options on the properties and so forth and started doing some studies and everybody sort of had a wait and see attitude. Everybody that ever came to Telluride to check things out was, by one way or another, they always were given Mahoney's name, was go up and talk to Mahoney. Initially, the town was very skeptical because he was basically a Chicago lawyer who had transferred himself to the Los Angeles area. Joe needed some help because he was not very well received in town, you right? Because I know that Joe went down to the Roma. Kate Mulvey was running the Roma at that time, had a restaurant down there, and she always fed the uh, Rotary Club down there. And Joe went down there and addressed them about his thoughts about putting a ski area here. As Joe came to her and asked, he says, well, who can I talk to? And she said, well, the only one that I think you might talk to is Bill Mahoney. He's kind of a, you know, a screwball skier, I guess you'd call me. We had uh, uh, dinner down at Kate's place, the only two in there in 19, October of 68. And, uh, you know, uh, I took a chance, but Joe asked me if I would, uh, you know, kind of be a consultant uh, and help him out on buying some of the land and stuff like that. And then there was another guy that came into picture, Dal Fullerton. He was a real estate guy here in town, and Dal was interested in skiing somewhat. He wasn't a skier in those days, but uh, Joe and, and uh, myself and Dal were the first two guys that really uh, got together and, and started uh, doing a lot of planning. When the opportunity came for my dad to get the job with uh, Joe Zilleen, I think we were all thrilled because mining was going out. And so my family certainly was supportive of it. Uh, I also knew a lot about the mining claims uh, during Joe Zoline's uh, reign. And uh, we, you needed to have those. And if you didn't buy them up front, the price was go up, up and up. Joe had to get somebody that really understood the mountain. And that is how he, how he got a meal, I have no idea. But anyway, a meal came over here in, in the winter of 1970. and. Uh, Joe asked me, he said, will you guide him around the mountain? And I said, oh, yeah. So I took a two-week vacation from Idorado, and Emil and I skied for two solid weeks. And I really believe that if it hadn't have been for Emil, we wouldn't have a ski area here today. We needed to do some more promotion, so we set up what we called snowcat skiing in uh, the winter of 70 and 71. And we had to go up to the top of uh, Joint Point, as it got its name later on. 
and uh, the people would uh, ski down through the through the little runs we had. They were pretty narrow. And then if they were real good skiers, then we'd take them down the, through the Mammoth Slide or the Power Line into town at Telluride. And uh, a lot of them really had a lot, of, a lot of fun, you know. Well, obviously, when he finally got enough money raised from investors and they, you know, and they, they had done their snow studies for a couple of winters and got a permit from the Forest Service and then got the money to build the first ski lifts in, in 72 and opened the area, and that was, of course, when people finally said, well, I'll be darned, it actually happened. Dave and Bill and, and I cut these runs out of Prospect Basin. That's where we were going to develop first in those days. you got to have a dreams uh, or thoughts. And uh, well, how wacky they are, I don't know, but mine were pretty wacky. If the skier hadn't come, we wouldn't be here. Nobody would be here. When I graduated from high school, there were 385 people living in Telluride. So it was really small, um, making a living here was difficult. Um, the people who lived here really wanted to be here, most of them. In those days, if you didn't do a certain occupations, you could not live there. You had to either work in the mine, you'd be a rancher, a few retail businesses like the drugstore, the restaurant, one or two. There was no real estate offices, there was no lawyers. Uh, there was no bank. We did our banking in Uray. They had a bank there. There was no dentist. Change is hard for some people, but I think the change was, was the mining was going out. And the good part was where people did sell their homes and probably got a lot more than they would have ever got. There were a lot of the miners that just, they don't have any part of it. And as soon as their house values went up, they sold and left. My family wasn't directly involved in the mining industry. They embraced the ski area, I think, from day one. and. All the people that moved here, my mom and dad became friends with them from, really, from the very beginning. The first time I came home over Christmas, there were strangers in Telluride, people I didn't know. And that was something that had, hadn't happened to me in, you know, all my high school life. I probably wouldn't have stayed in Telluride had the ski area not come about because there really wasn't anything that interested me at the time. I wasn't going to work in the mine. I knew that. And that was the only other thing available at the time. Yeah, being on the ski patrol definitely influenced me to stay here and be a part of the ski area and be a part of the community. Even when we'd go up on these trips to climb up and ski down, and we, with Mahoney, we talk about this would make a great run or whatever. We speculate on how that would change things and not knowing whether it ever happened or not. And now that it has happened, sometimes I look back and I thought, boy, who would have thunk this ever could have happened the way it did? I didn't understand that, that there would be a mountain village or, you know, that the mesas would be built on. I didn't understand any of that. I'll tell you, I never dreamed it would be what it is now, you know, because it's, it's really um, grown a lot more than I ever thought it would. I was excited that, you know, there may be a real ski area here someday. You know, it wasn't like you sit around like, oh boy, there's going to be a ski area. It was kind of like, what, what's dad doing to bring home money to pay for the bills and stuff? Well, obviously, the, the change in skiing in Telluride, of course, uh, from the little rope toe that we had at the bottom of the hill, uh, and only on weekends and so forth compared to what we have now is, is it's just a quantum leap. So there, there's, no, there's no comparison at all in the type of skiing you have now. It's, it's much, much better, of course, much larger scale. Uh, at the same time, though, it, it's changed the nature of, of the town drastically. You know, when we were really young and we were strong and we could ski really hard and the bumps were big and the, I mean, really big and they weren't cut very often and then now we're getting to where the, <laughs> the bumps are cut more. It's easier to ski some of the more difficult runs. There's more terrain opening up uh, so you really, you know, you can stay here and be challenged in terms of where you want to ski. And a lot of the changes have been really positive since the ski area has come in. Um, as I said before, I think, you know, there are so many more opportunities to do different things. There are lots of really interesting people. And there's certainly different kinds of people, so you, you get to meet new people. I mean, I've made some great friends with the people that moved here 30 years ago. 
People claim that it was more snow back in the 20s and 30s and the 40s. Well, you know, I've always told people, I said, you know, back in the 30s, you know why the snow looked deeper? Because you were shorter. Winters were longer and came earlier and stayed later than they do now. And the thing of it is, they didn't have the equipment to plow the streets. My dad was the, the town night cop, and it was his job to take the little red fire truck and plow Main Street and some of the side streets. You know, there it is, we get back to, a, to technology and equipment. When people talk about changes in the snow, I think it's, to me, it's because they, they didn't plow everything like they do now, and snow's removed so fast. I mean, we used to, um, a sled on Catholic Hill and on Gallagher Hill, you know, and now that's always plowed and the roads are um, paved now. Everything was dirt. So the snow, of course, doesn't stay around like it did. So it, it's been an amazing change and I have real mixed feelings about it at times because I thought, gosh, if you ever read the, you know, the book Shangri-La, you know, I, I thought this was what this is. This is a little hidden valley in the mountains that nobody ever knows about and, and you come in here and uh, it, it's, a, it's a special place, it's a, a unique place. From an educator's perspective, it's been wonderful that we have all these opportunities for kids, um, you know, based on influence of different people, of different activities, of demand for great, better education. I think all of that is, is really great. Back in those days, the only thing you had to look forward to was the 4th of July celebration. Now, there's a festival every weekend. And you know, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise, but you gotta look at it. it, it, it helps business. Look what has come here. You know, it's, it's in, like now, it's so many ways, it's like living in a city without all the, the negative stuff that goes with the city, because there are opportunities to do almost anything you'd like to do. I think that the bluegrass, uh, uh, the film festival, and right on down the line, I think they're very important. That is just as important as a winter ski aspect. It, it was so quiet because there was no activity going on. There wasn't any construction in those days. There wasn't any traffic. It was just that calm, silent, you know, summer evenings. And it, it was a, it was a, a, a wonderful time. And, and uh, that type of a, of a atmosphere doesn't exist anymore because it's, it's uh, bustling and, you know, there's traffic and construction and whatnot. I mean, we all learned how to have fun skiing in those early years. I mean, it was great. Great fun. There wasn't anybody on the ski mountain, so you didn't have to worry about being a ski patrolman. You could just go around and ski. <laughs> I met my husband here. I have two kids here, and they loved it. Some changes you don't like, but you know it is what it is. It changes everywhere, and you had to just go with the flow, enjoy life. <laughs> and with Revelation Bowl now, you know you can just sit down there on the deck and just totally. Catch out if that's what you want to do. There's a lot of things I don't especially agree with what they're doing in town, but you got to look at it this way, you know. Hell, I'm 81 years old. I had my day in the sun, it, and the people got to live with what they create, and more power to them, you know. Uh, 50 years from now, <laughs> these same people, if they're still around, it'll be different. That's Dave Farney there. Yeah. <laughs> this is called skiing through the trees. <laughs> See, we found a little patch of snow. Yeah. <laughs> 